Hi, it's Elizabeth Willett here from Investing in Women and I am delighted because we are live on Facebook and LinkedIn and I'm with the wonderful Caroline Green from The Talent Cycle. I'm going to be talking all about how to get employers chasing you. So as people are logging on, if you can let us know if you can hear us all right, maybe give us a like or an emoji that would be absolutely fabulous but yeah we are live today on Facebook and on LinkedIn and I'm with Caroline Green from the talent cycle I'm going to be talking all about how to get employers chasing you which I'm really really excited to do <laughs> this is such a good subject so thank yeah. you so much for joining us I think we all would like to feel quite exhausting isn't it constantly searching for jobs it's quite nice to be chased for once. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Why do all the work? Get those employees chasing you. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank you for joining us. Do you want to um, to introduce yourself, explain what you do, who, what you, who you work for? Yep, sure. So uh, my name is Karen Green. I um, am the founder of The Talent Cycle, which is a business that I set up a few years ago, having worked kind of in and around careers and learning and development for, gosh, over 15 years. Let's just, <laughs> let's just leave it there. Not, let's, let's not count exact numbers. Um, and I am a career development expert. So what that means is I support people to kind of figure out what they want to do for their careers. Um, I specifically help people who maybe have got a bit of an idea, but they're just not quite sure on the details and kind of how to get there. So I support people working out some of that. So that might be through career coaching or career guidance. And then I do a lot of the support that I do is around kind of the practical steps that people need to take. Um, so actually how to get those roles. So things like how to get employers chasing you <laughs> um, and job hunting and CV writing and things like that. And then finally, as I say, I'm also a learning development professional. So I support people that, you know, once you're in that new career, how do you actually sort of hit the ground running? How do you actually really thrive um, in that role? So that's wow. what I do with my company. Brilliant. And so do you work with individuals or with companies? I do. So I do a mixture. So I do some freelancing with large organisations. So particularly um, either working with companies that work with people in schools um, yeah. or organisations that particularly support people with outplacement. So for those who don't know, um, that's supporting people who are going through that redundancy process. Um, so okay. many companies as part of that will offer um, some advice and support to, to those existing employees around you know again it's that sort of practical support so things like how to jump on where to jump on cv writing and things like that so i do kind of freelance work in yeah. that sense but i do also work a lot with private clients absolutely and um, particularly those who are kind of new to the to the job market so either completely new so i do also work with sort of graduates or those who are sort of in the first few years after university um or people who are perhaps new in terms of the career change perhaps they uh, gone off to and, and been doing the other busy, busy role of being a mum um, and then come back to, to the workplace um, and are trying to kind of negotiate that. Um, or just new in, in terms of perhaps they're, they're sort of new into a different career change, different role, or in new into a management yeah. role and things like that. So, yes, we're lots of private clients as well. Brilliant. Oh, well, Hannah's joined us. So, thank you, Hannah. Um, hope you can hear us all right. So thank you. Um, so, do you want to talk? Um, I know you've got a brilliant presentation, which looks yep. fantastic. So I um, can't wait to see that. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you're going to cover today? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as you, as you mentioned, it's all about getting employers chasing you. So it is really hard. It is really exhausting. It's that, it's that thing, isn't it, of finding a job as a full time job in itself. Um, yep. So anything that you can do to stand yourself in really good stead, to make life a little bit easier for yourself, to make sure that you are a really ideal, attractive candidate for all of those employers. Um, particularly in this market at the moment, for obvious reasons, it's got big challenges at the moment. I think there's lots of opportunities as well. Um, so this session is all about sort of how to turn things on, on its head and to turn that kind of traditional job hunting, just going on job website, applying, sending off CV and crushing fingers and hoping for the best. It's actually about other proactive things that you can do to become liked, known and trusted um, by employers so that when you do make applications or perhaps they even come to you with a job offer, um, how, how that all works. So that's what the session's all about today. Brilliant. Yes, it's basically making them want to hire you before you've even applied. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So we've got Afstar as well that's joined us. So thank you. So um, are you ready if I put the presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, brilliant.
no, I don't worry everyone, it's not death by PowerPoint. It just helps keep me keep me focused. <laughs> really good, I love it. <laughs> so, um, so is that sharing correctly with everyone? I can just see all the slides. Yeah, it looks like I don't know if you um you can see all the top of that. Right, okay. Um, so, as I mentioned uh, just now, this is the session about getting employers chasing you. So, there's that traditional um, view um, of, you know, that you're chasing around after employers. So, you know, you're, the, you're this person in the dungarees, trying to sort of running down, hunting down the employers, and this is the employer here. But actually, as the world of work changes, there are different approaches, different ways that you can turn things on its head. Um, and so, you know, the chaser becomes the chasey. Um, and to get employers uh, really interested in who you are, what you're all about, thinking about you as the perfect candidate for, for their company to go and work with them. So that's what this session um, is all about. So I've already introduced myself, so I'm going to skip over that slide. Uh, so sorry, let me just pull this up correctly. Right. Can you see that in full screen? Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry, technical issues. Uh, so I've introduced myself already, so I won't, <laughs> I won't bore you with that. Um, so there's different steps to take when it comes to getting employers chasing you. So step one is realising that you are amazing. I don't know how many people are on this call. I know that's probably there's probably a few hundred that have kind of signed up as, as being possibly interested. And I can absolutely guarantee that each and every single one of you is absolutely amazing. And as particularly as women, we're not very good at always acknowledging that um, and realising that ourselves. And if you want to get employers chasing you and thinking that you're amazing, that they want to work with you, you've got to start by thinking about you know, being your own superhero, thinking about how amazing you are. But I appreciate that's you know, it's very easy for me to say, it's not always easy to do. So I've got some advice about how you do that. So this is all around kind of working out your amazing brand, so your, your own personal brand that, as I say, employers will be able to see and, and get interested in. So just like any kind of organisation, any sort of business will have a brand, you need to be doing the same when it comes to job hunting and working out you know, your own amazing brand. So there's different things that you can do to help you because this will base, be based around things like your experience, your strengths, your skills, your values actually are really important and what matters to you um, because you're going to want to make sure that those align with, with those of an employer. And it works both ways. An employer will want to see, you know, do your values link to their sort of company values. It's also thinking about how to kind of best sell yourself. So I know uh, Liz was just saying there's some questions about things like career breaks and career changes and things like that. It's about selling what you have done um, in the best possible way. So for example, if you've had a career in something else, don't see that as a negative. You will have built up a whole range of brilliant skills and experiences um, that you can relate to a new career. You just need to really think about those and how you sell those as being transferable skills. Same as having a break, that's not a bad thing. Quite often, as I say, people will have a break to go and raise a family, for example. Think about all the skills and experiences that you have doing that and what, you know, it, it sort of sounds like it's very different to, to the workplace, but my goodness, can you, you know, as a mum, I'm sure <laughs> there's lots of mums who are very used to multitasking, for example, you know, um, and that's, it's those sorts of things that you can go and, and sell to employers. So there's, there's absolutely no harm in having those things and, and, and they are absolutely things that you can go out and sell. Um, and a really good activity that you can do, sometimes I work with clients um, doing this career timeline activity if they're trying to figure out actually what it is they want to do in the future. Um, but also it's a good opportunity, it's a good way of thinking about actually, you know, if you are sort of sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I haven't got any experience, I haven't got any strengths, and you have. Um, it's just sort of thinking about drawing those out from your, your career history. So as you can see, you don't... <laughs> As you can see from my little picture here, you don't need to be an artist at all to do this activity, so don't panic. Um, I love it, like, yeah, trying to explain the picture, it looks so yes, interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is their sort of career timeline activity. So if you take a piece of paper, draw a little mm -hmm. picture of yourself, so there I am in my little bed dress, waving away. Um, so that's me after leaving university. Um, and think, if you know, if you think about the top part of the page is your sort of career highs, if you like, um, and the yeah. bottom part is your career lows. And just draw out as a timeline and just just as a line um thinking through the different jobs that you've done 
you know, whether they were sort of good experiences or bad experiences or sometimes somewhere in between. So, for example, next, you know, my first, after I left university, I sort of did a bit of temping and, and bits and bobs there, which was okay. It wasn't really a career high or low, but it, it was useful. Um, and then I got my first kind of proper job, which was a learning development kind of role, which I absolutely loved, which you can see in that first sort of smiley face there. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, you know, the next job I had was not so great. Um, and it doesn't have to be individual jobs. It can be, you know, thinking about that timeline. It might be that you worked um, in a particular career for, I don't know, five years doing that job and, and think about the highs and lows during that time. So do that as a first activity and then think about actually why were those highs and lows? So for me, when I did this activity, it sort of it was, you know, my highs and what you will do then is start spotting some kind of common themes. So I realised my highs were where I got the opportunity to help people, to support people, uh, where I wasn't micromanaged, you know, I was allowed to kind of be creative and go out there and, and do things. And it helped me pull out some of so that creativity, for example. I wouldn't naturally say that the jobs that I have done in my career are particularly creative on the face of it. You know, if you look at the job titles, you wouldn't necessarily think that they're creative. But the more I kind of unpicked what it was I liked about those roles, the more I could see all the strengths and the skills and things that I was using. So that's why it's a really good thing. Um, as I say, I, I do it a lot with clients, um, both in terms of looking at what actually they may want to do as a career, but also thinking about those skills and those strengths and those experiences. And kind of linked to that, I think it's really important to think about what problem do you solve for an employer? So again, going back to those, those questions that Liz had been asked before as well, I would say to those the people that had asked those, you know, think about what problem do you solve for that employer because when you're selling yourself actually it's not even about you it's about them and how you can fit in and solve a problem for them so if we say just as an example a you know there might be a, a call center manager um, yes. who is looking to hire a team leader for example what problem do you solve for them well the problem that they've probably got is that they are too busy they haven't got enough time to manage you know possibly even hundreds of people in a call center Thinking about often people in call centres are perhaps less experienced in the world of work. They may not have developed those skills um, of, you know, how it works, you're getting on with other people, being there on time, things like that. No disrespect to anyone who works in call centres, I'm not saying everybody's like this, but um, I'm sure that there are sort of some young people perhaps who are in that, um, in that role. Yeah. So thinking about if you were going to apply for that team leader role, what to actually, you know, what problem do you solve um, for that employer? Well, you've got that history, you've got that experience, you can talk about how you've worked with different people, you can talk about how you've worked in challenging situations or fast-paced environments. It's what problem do you solve? You'll solve all of that for that employer. So that's what you really need to focus on. Both in terms of when you're telling yourself generally online, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, you know, setting up, like we mentioned before, that brand before you even actually apply for a role. But the same will go when it comes to your CV, is thinking about what problem you solve. And that all forms part of your kind of personal brand as well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, my screen has now frozen, that's not very helpful. There we are. Um, so that's sort of the first step is just taking that time out to figure out, you know, your amazingness. Um, and the sort of details of that. So then the second step is thinking about, you know, making sure it's no good just you knowing that you're amazing, you've got to get out there and tell them how amazing you are. So that's the next yeah. step that we're going to have, sort of have a look at. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, it's about becoming liked, known and trusted in your particular field. Now, even if you don't have any experience in a particular area that you want to get into, you can still build up and become liked, known and trusted in that particular thing. It might be that you do some research, think about the hot topics, think about what other key problems that people in that sector that you want to get into um, are having and coming up with sort of solutions to those. Um, and you can talk about those. So whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's another social media platform or whether it's even, you know, face to face. <laughs> now it's starting to open up a little bit and we can actually do that again. So you may go to a networking event, for example, um, or you may go to um, a kind of career job fair. It's having those conversations um, to become liked, known and trusted. So liked is about that being personable. You know, people want to do business with people. Um, so it, it, it's that sort of approach. 
and as I say, becoming known and trusted is about establishing that um, that thing on social media or in person where you can show that you really know your stuff. So you can start talking about that and, and you can become known as that sort of go-to person in that area that you're interested in. So I mentioned LinkedIn there a little bit. So in LinkedIn, on LinkedIn, I should say, um, there are about 706 million people using LinkedIn. Um, and in the UK alone, there are about 27 million people. So bearing in mind there's about 66 million people, I think it is in the UK. I don't know what the adults yeah. So it's, yeah, so the sort of the um, kind of working age range of adults, that's pretty much everyone. Um, and yeah. I talk to a lot of clients, I know lots of you are watching from LinkedIn, so hopefully you're kind of <laughs> fully signed up to the, to the LinkedIn uh, train. Um, but a lot of clients that I work with, I don't know, I think there's something about because it's a professional network, they're sort of a little bit hesitant about going on where. Um, honestly, yeah. it's nothing, and you know, Liz, I know you're on there a lot, aren't you? It's, it's nothing to be afraid of, is it? It's a great environment. I really like LinkedIn. I prefer LinkedIn to Facebook and Instagram. I mean, yeah. I actually find I get more spam and things like that on Facebook and Instagram. I find that actually you develop more relationships with people on LinkedIn. Absolutely, yeah, and it's a professional network, isn't it? It's, it's people go there to do business in whatever way, and like you say, so that's where you make more, you know, better Actually, connections. personal connections. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of people I'm meeting up to. My one who's someone who I met um, on LinkedIn who happens to live um, kind of near nearby. So I think it's, although it's a professional network, absolutely, I do think as well over the past few years, it has softened its edges a little yeah. bit and it, you know as the world of work changes and we're all bringing our whole selves to work you know <laughs> that was happening anyway even pre-pandemic but you know certainly lately that's definitely happened um and people are just being a bit more natural natural and personable um it kind of is it feels a slightly softer place but it's still a really great place to make really good connections yeah 100 yes yeah, so yeah. And, you know, and for recruiters such as stuff is, I'm sure that if you have a CV that lands on your desk, the first thing you do is go and have a look at their LinkedIn profile, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's also why it's really important. I'm not going to go into masses of details about setting up your profile, because I know Liz did a really good um, blog post um, about that recently, about all the different things. Yours looks just... really good. I'm looking at yours. I love all the picture and all the headline. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's... there's it's prime real estate is how I describe it to many of my clients because it's yeah. you know free, it doesn't cost you anything. This is your opportunity to go and sell yourself. And I'll talk about CVs in a second. Um, also, but actually, only... um, I was going to say, if you Google your name, often your LinkedIn profile will come up as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. So that's that's really um, good and really important and really good to kind of get your name out there as well. Yeah. Um, and you know there's only so much you can put on your cv and we'll talk about that in a second this is kind of some opportunity to add a little bit of color a little bit of flavor to what you've already said on your cv so that's my one tip is just make sure that your profile although it should match your cv in terms of things like you know your jobs and the dates that you did those jobs don't just copy and paste your cv onto linkedin because someone like liz for example will receive your cv she will get lots of information from your cv and then she will go on linkedin and have a look at that if you're just saying the same thing that you've said in your cv not kind of selling yourself even more so think about that it's an opportunity to really sell the things that you are either particularly proud of um or things that you just haven't been able to add into your cv in one way or another it might be things like rec getting recommendations skills and endorsements and recommendations on linkedin is so 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 important so please if you can make sure that you have those because that's a really good way to sell yourself um you know that and getting that employer chasing you if they've landed on your profile page and they can see that you've got lots of recommendations of other people saying how amazing you are that just supports your message even more yeah. um and if you haven't got you know perhaps you've got someone who could write you the most amazing recommendation ever but they're not on linkedin for example <laughs> one of the few <laughs> handful of people who aren't linkedin on linkedin you can always quote them perhaps in your about section when you're talking about the work that you've done and, and can get it in that way as well so that's in terms of your profile itself. But again, we're not, you know, when we want to get employers testing us, we're not just going to sit there passively. We're not going to do a very lovely profile that people may or may not see. We're going to go out there and proactively use um, LinkedIn. I'm, not, I'm sorry, as I said, I'm talking about LinkedIn, but the, the same applies to other forms of social media as well. You can use it in this way as well. So then it's actually about proactively you know, making use of it. 
So thinking about networking, you know, LinkedIn is all about online networking. You don't just have to know the people that you are connecting with. Um, think about targeted networking. So you can do searches not just by name, but you can do searches by geographical location. You can do searches by job title. So, for example, if you are perhaps if you have had a career break and you're trying to get back into either the same sector or a different one, um, you could have a look at some people with the kind of job titles that you're looking for. So let's just say you want to become a project manager, for example. You can search for project managers and connect with them, start interacting with them, see the conversations that they have. I often talk to clients about the fact that every sector has got its own language um, and that's half your battle with an employer is learning that language um, of that particular sector so that will help you with that um, it may be a targeted networking approach as well so it might be that um, you go for the level above what you're looking for so for example rather than connecting with project managers connect with senior project managers because those could be your potential hiring managers and what that means is if you've become liked, known and trusted by them, so you've connected with them and then they've seen all the fabulous things that you're posting, and I'll talk about this in a minute, that when they are then looking for something to hire someone, you're going to be the first person that they come to. Or perhaps you've had to go through the process of, of applying for a role, um, but your CV lands on their desk and they think, oh, yes, I know that person. Yeah, I know that. On um, definitely makes a, a difference. And I'm sure Liz, even for yourself, with kind of recruiters, that's, that's a similar kind of thing, is it not? Yeah, definitely. I think I think people probably underestimate the no like and trust factor, but it is it's all about networking, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And getting to know people and, and getting them to know you. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, when you've got these massive, um, amazing online platforms, it's a really good opportunity to do that. Don't forget as well there's value in, in local networking as well. So like I say, as things are opening up, there's lots of more sort of things that are starting already I've noticed. Um so kind of linked to that as well. As well as kind of thinking about targeting individuals, think about different groups or companies. Again, it's all about learning the lingo, following what's happening um, in those sectors, following you know what's the particular pain point for for a company. If you're going to be interviewed by a company, you want to make sure that you understand about that company. So it's a great way to build up your knowledge. And also kind of connected to that as well as that interacting and commenting. So don't just proactively go out there and make a network, a uh, load of connections to build up your network, and then don't talk to them again. You know, he's, he's thinking about either posting things yourself, and there's loads of different things that you can do. You can do polls, you can do articles, um, your status, you can do videos, which are great from a kind of SEO point of view. They sort of push you up the rankings. Um, don't be afraid and modest with all of this. Go out there and really sell yourself. Um, so you can do it proactively in that way, but also commenting on what other people are writing about as well um, is a really good thing to do to build up this network. So that's a really good way of kind of going out there. Um, I'm really targeting that hidden job market. Um, so it's not just a case of going to one kind of recruitment site, um, you know, downloading their adverts, applying, and then that's it. It's that multi-funnel approach. So through those networks, you may find out about jobs that don't, you know, haven't even been advertised yet. You may be uh, working with recruiters, um, you know, work with someone like Liz who will have you in her mind when a role comes in and she will say, ah, yes, this is the person that I need to contact about this role. It's that sort of proactive um, approach is really key to all of this. And then finally, step three, it's about evidencing your amazingness. Um, so this is all about when, you, when it does actually come to that point of you know, applying for roles. Um, what do you do? How do you show how amazing you are? You've figured it out by doing your timeline. You've kind of given them a flavour already by putting online all your amazing, wonderful things. Um, how do you actually get more sort of specific about this and, and targeted kind of approach to amazingness? So often, you know, that's going to come down to having a really great CV or it may be an application form. Application forms, it's exactly the same principle. So in terms of CVs, think about the style of your CV. So there are different types um, of, of style formats that you can have for a CV. Uh, some of the main, most common ones are the sort of traditional chronological CV. So that's where you've got your most recent job that you've done first, at the, sort of at the top of the page, um, with some bullet points about what you did as part of that role, and then you kind of work your way backwards. There's a skills or a functional CV, um, which is particularly good if either you haven't got a huge amount of experience or you are looking to change. Um, so again, you know, I know somebody was talking about changing career. Um, okay. 
sometimes this can be a good way of, of doing it. Um, so you pick out four or five different um, key skills that you have. And then rather than, um, so this is difficult to explain. So four or five sort of key skills and then under those key skills, put your evidence. So it's almost like you take your bullet points out of kind of where they were under the different job titles and you put them under the key skills. Um, and then at the end of that, you just literally have a list of the jobs and the dates that you worked there. Okay. I don't know, Liz, do you sort of see many sort of those sorts of I haven't of... seen, no, because someone actually, quite interesting, someone last week approached me and said, I've got a skills space CV. Um, and they, they weren't getting a lot of interviews, but I'd never actually seen a skills space CV. Right. I think it's something that's kind of come along more recently. Okay. I think it's come from lots of people, you know, we are working in a world now where you don't just have one job and it's a job for life or, you know, a particular career and you work your work ladder. People are having more kind of, it's more like a jigsaw puzzle where people do different bits of different types of career. They want to change um, and sort of fitting that jigsaw puzzle together almost. And so the skills basically, I think they've come out of that really because it's a good opportunity because you may well have some really good skills, but you've just used them in a different sector. Um, so it's about putting the emphasis on the skills rather than the job title that you've had. So there are positives to it, and that's why I think they are starting to become more popular. Like I said, they're often um, used by young people who haven't got so much experience, you know, job experience, but want to sell the skills that they've maybe gathered from other things through volunteering or what have you. Um, but I think actually for, for people who are, like I say, looking to change career and things, they can be useful. What I would just say, and actually you just really highlighted my point, is not everyone is familiar with them, not everyone is aware of them. Some people sort of are a bit suspicious of them. Um, so I would say make sure you know your market, um, you know, know who it is that you are applying to and think actually, is this is this the best option? Yeah. Um, and it may well be, and I'll come to a couple of points actually about why sometimes the skills based CV isn't the best. Um, what might be sort of the skills basically it would be quite confusing. I can see the benefit. Yeah. As a recruiter, if you're trying to just read through and you've got like you come in on a Monday morning, you've got about 50 CVs, applications that come through from the weekend, and you're just trying to quickly. Yeah. And it's quite it's probably easier for a recruiter to have all the CVs formatted in the same. Like, yeah, absolutely. And I think what you need to say find what you need to find. Absolutely, and I think, and I'll come back to that point in a second if that's okay, because actually I think that's a really yeah. important point actually about that whole process with CVs. So, but just quickly before I forget, there is a third type of CV, which is a design CV, which okay. is more of a kind of one pager, uh, very pretty. You see templates around. Sometimes I've got a photo of the individual. Uh, sometimes there's other drawings. Um, it's generally kind of very sort of design led. Looks very pretty. These things look beautiful. And I've had a lot of clients who I've had to sort of slightly break their hearts by saying, actually, it looks really pretty, but it hasn't got the information. You know, CVs, they are, they're not there to be pretty. They're there to sell yourself for a particular role. Um, and often those CVs um, just don't do that. So why would they're too it? brief, actually. Some people's CVs are too long, but then some people's CVs yeah. are just too brief and you can't actually see what they did. It's, it's a sweet spot, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So sometimes, you know, so having that old traditional style can be best just to make sure that you are kind of covering all the things because, like you say, and often there's design CVs, it's because they're sort of so busy trying to make it look pretty that there isn't the space actually um to put all the information that you need as yeah. a recruiter. I think if you were maybe applying for a graphic designer or something like that, then that might yeah. be useful. It can be if it's an accountant job then probably not. No. Um <laughs> and that kind of leads to the sort of the other sort of next point is thinking about put yourself in the shoes of where this is going. So when you send off your C V it's gonna go to one of a couple of places. It's either going to go through a thing called applicant tracking software or ATS, um, which is a piece of software that filters CV. So like Les says, it helps individuals, recruiters, HR people, even hiring managers to filter those CVs because when they're getting 50, 100, 150 CVs come through the door, um, you know, they haven't got time to look through them all. So it helps them filter. Now, because it's a piece of software, um, it doesn't have a brain, it can't think about, you know, like, like you were saying, it's sort of working out, so sometimes skills-based CVs can kind of confuse it a little bit. Um, it certainly can't read something like a design CV because of the way, the nature of it, of how it's designed. Um, it can't read tables, so sometimes I've seen clients who've sort of tried to make their CV very neat and tidy by putting a table in there, which is great in theory, 
but the reality is that applicant tracking software can't read that table so what it does is just skips over it so you've told that employer loads of really really useful information about yourself but it's not been acknowledged so, that, so it's just and I don't I work a lot with clients who sort of I can see their hearts sort of sink a little bit as I talk about ATS it's nothing to be frightened of all you need to do all you need to remember is have a really clear simple CV so that either a piece of software or a human being um, can read it clearly and can see it's all about matching it's this is what the job description is saying this is what the CV is and make sure that the two things match yeah. So I think as well, sometimes, um, and we talked about this before, didn't we, Liz, about that, and, and that people, that that's the key thing. I would say if you are sending off your CV a lot um, and you're not getting responses, even for roles that you think, I'm perfectly qualified for that, I've told them all the stuff, it's probably just how you are wording it. Um, so it might be something like, for example, if you're looking for a project management role and they're talking about, you know, key, um, a key thing that they're looking for is someone who can manage stakeholders, and you haven't said that in your CV, perhaps you've implied it or you talk about working with others or something like that, um, you know, that piece of software or perhaps even that individual, it might be kind of a junior HR person who first of all looks at this um, CV who hasn't got that specialist knowledge. And I think, you know, Liz, even, even with yourself, I'm sure you've had, you know, lots yeah, of experience, I, but you're not a specialist in those jobs, are you? No, I mean, I can give an example. I mean, I used to recruit consultants and we've looked at a specific system. So I recruit workday consultants right. so they could also be called like hcm consultants and some people would put like a hcm consultant maybe on their cv and i would as a recruiter would know what that meant but if we had programmed um an ats system to just look for workday it would miss those people so it's really important i think to mirror make sure your cv mirrors the exact language that is being used in the job ad yeah absolutely um, anything about or any abbreviations or yeah absolutely yeah, it goes back to, or whatever yeah because that's that thing we talked about earlier about you know it's about learning the lingo of the sector yeah um, exactly. specifically like you say Liz, that job advert um is making sure you know we talk a lot about and i think a lot of the clients that i work with are aware that you're meant to tweak your cv but they just sort of think i'll jiggle this post you know jiggle these um bullet points around a bit or are or quite often i find people change a lot on their cover letter um, which actually is fine, but that, you know, that's what we go through the software. It's, you know, it's like Liz says, it's, it's about making sure that the exact words match what's on that job description. Um, and kind of linked to that as well is thinking about, you know, like Liz said, if it's, if it's in front of a human being particularly, they haven't got time to read through every single bullet point you have got on your CV. The reality is they will spend probably a few seconds looking at your CV and just skim read it as a first kind of look and make their decision based on that. So often I find clients will just tell them all of the things that they've ever done, you know, in, the, in their whole life. And, um, you know, I've, I had this conversation with a CFO recently, he got things like his GCSE results in there, and it's like, you, you know, the, the, you're not going to get hired on your, with all due respect, you're not going to get hired based on your GCSE results. Put your highest level of qualification, so you've got a degree or what have you, take the other stuff out. Or don't tell us every single thing that you've done in your current role. Think about what are the things that are relevant. You know, I might have done something that I'm really proud of and that was great and I used, you know, great skills and things. But actually, if it's got nothing to do with this role that I'm looking at, does it really need to be there? So for every bullet point on your CV or every sentence, you know, having a personal profile, the key skills or key achievements section that needs to go on the top, think to yourself, so what? Why am I putting this here? Why, you know, what problem does this solve? the employer you know it's going back to that thing again what's my personal brand making sure that it is linking to all of that and that it's not just sort of things that you just sort of are proud of um and then as i sort of said backing up your argument with linkedin as well so a recruiter will or a hiring manager will have a look at your cv the first thing they will do probably is go to linkedin so make sure that your link your linkedin profile supports what you're saying in your cv um, and, you know, adding, I said about adding value and think about that, so what? Think about metrics, think about evidence, rather than general sweeping statements, see if you can put some detail in there as well. Um, and I just kind of, this bit down the bottom here is just actually copied from, <laughs> sorry Liz, I should have checked if I could do this with, before I did it, um, but just a sort of screenshot from one of the roles that this is advertising at the moment, if I was writing someone's CV for them, it was an LND role, I would be going through 
and what I would probably do is print off that advert and I would go through and I would highlight all the words that are sort of the key words that keep coming up, key things that are really, really important or, you know, underline um, words or like you said, sort of if there's any particular acronyms or anything like that. And then I would look at the person's CV and make sure that they match. So I would literally break it down kind of bit by bit. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're working on a master's CV and you're not quite sure what job you're, you know, you haven't got a specific job that you're applying for, I would say just pick some that you might be interested in. It doesn't even have to be kind of a local job that you could do. Just pick some that you're interested in, see what language they are using and make sure that you have those in your master's CV. Okay, so that's more than enough of me talking at you. Um, I hope that everyone has found that useful and we'll have a, uh, some time for questions in a second. Um, but just to sort of remind, remind you all that uh, my name is Caroline Green, uh, my company is called Talent Cycle. If you'd like to get in touch with me about any of my services, then please do so. I've got my details here. I am kind of working behind, you know, behind the scenes at the moment to redo my website, but hopefully it will um, give you all the information you need. I have um, programs, so I have the Talent Transformation Program that takes, takes you through the three steps that I've talked about, some of which is kind of e-learning e um, to make it more affordable. Um, but then there's tailored one-to-one -one career guidance sessions with myself at the end of each of those modules. Um, or I do more specific things. So I do do CV writing. If, if what I've said now has just kind of overwhelmed you and you want someone to write the CV for you, I can always do that. Or I can coach you on how to write winning CV as well. Um, and also I'm on social media. If you would like a copy of the slides that I've been through today, or I have got, I've, I've briefly mentioned before about the cover letter. Um, so although CVs is where you kind of tweak and make relevant um, to that particular role, cover letters are really, really important. Um, I don't know what you think about cover letters actually, Liz. What's your take on them? Do you think they are important to have or not? Because my take I think is they are. Have. I mean, I think people mostly put it, don't they, in an email, take a cover yeah. letter. Yeah. Um, it come in the post. But yeah, I mean, I think it does entice you in. Um, it's where you can really self emphasize your key skills and your strengths and um, you know entice somebody to click on you maybe you know yeah. not not um, i'll come back to that application it make you you know as a recruiter to open it up yeah absolutely um and i think i think that's the thing isn't it it's, it's someone can ignore it if they want to it doesn't matter all you've done is wasted a little bit of time um if they're looking for it and it's not there then that's not going to stand you in good stead and like you say it can no. draw people in it gives you know it's more personal isn't it yeah it you a bit more human yeah and again it's, it's an opportunity to let you say to sort of make you a bit more human you can cover anything if you have got any concerns so for example if you have had a career break or something like that you could mention that in your letter as to why that that's a good thing um or you know again if you are changing careers you could talk about again why that is a good thing um and like Liz says obviously in, in, in the world we live in now i talk about cover letters actually i could be I, I need to start changing my language to cover emails, really. Um, but it's sort of the same principle when it's a letter or an email. Um, but I do have, I know that my clients often struggle with how to structure those. Um, so I do have a free template um, that I'm more than happy to share with everyone who's listening today. So again, if you just drop me an email or contact me on social media, I am on LinkedIn, obviously, um, yeah. as you can tell, I'm sure. Um, so feel free to connect with me and I can send you um, that information and also send your That's the Ask the Talent Cycle at Outlook.com. Yes, yep. Uh, so Ask the Talent Cycle at Outlook.com. Well, like okay. I said, just contact me on LinkedIn as well. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. People are saying thank you for the advice. Thank you so much for the informative session. Um, thanks for the great advice on CV writing. Um, so we did have some questions before, but I think we've covered them. Right. So maybe if if people feel we haven't covered them, just let us know. But um, how, how to sell yourself after a long career break. I think we sort of covered that sort of thing about drawing out your experience. I think so, yeah. It, it's just... Relevant experience. Yeah, it's pulling out that relevant experience. Um, and there's nothing wrong with having a career break. It's talking about, and maybe it's talking about things that you might have done during that time. It's kind of turns on why you've had a career break. Um, if it's due to sort of raising a family, you can talk about that. And, you know, people are completely understanding. I think the world is becoming more flexible and understanding the fact that we all have lives and, you know, that that's okay. And it's about selling those, those skills and those experiences that you have even outside of the world of work. Um, if it's for other reasons as well, maybe that's because of health or um, 
redundancy and things like that, that's absolutely fine too. You know, I think most of us will have gone through experiences of those as well. Um, but maybe think about, again, selling those skills that you've had and also thinking about how will you sort of show them that you've kept up to date with some of those skills. So have you perhaps done, there's you know, so many opportunities to do free kind of courses online and things like that now. Um, you know, even sort of short courses. Again, LinkedIn has lots of great uh, resources. There's things like LinkedIn Learning that you can kind of um, have a look at. Um, or you know, sites like Udemy has really good um, courses that, you know, like I say, lots of them are free and very short. But things like that where you can just show that you kind of dipped your toe in um, whilst you haven't been working. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, good. And then we we really covered this, I think, how, try and, um, how to enter a new industry, industry you have no experience of, I think you mean. Yeah, um, I think the only other thing that I haven't mentioned actually with the new industry, I would say, is think about who is the sort of professional body. Um, so for myself, where I kind of started off as a sort of L&D role, but very quickly moved into careers and spent a lot of time working in kind of careers. When I moved into learning development, um, L&D is very much connected with HR um, and CIPD is the professional body. So the first thing I did was went and had a look on the CIPD website. Um, and got loads of information on there. And, and I genuinely think doing that meant that I learned just about enough lingo um, that when I had to do kind of my first interview and I had to present on what I would, you know, the, the new L&D programme that I would bring to this organisation, I'd learned just about enough from the CIPD website that I could just, you know, <laughs> wing it, enough wing it. Sound like I knew more, yeah, wing it, it, like I knew more than I probably actually did at the time. So I think that's that's a really useful thing to do because there's membership bodies. And they will give you information as well. They will tell you, you know, what the other thing I do is support other careers professionals or other careers coaches or careers advisors, and particularly careers advice, um, with young people, there are very specific qualifications that you need to do. So I always sort of send them to the Career Development Institute website, which gives them all the information they need about that. Okay, brilliant. What's that? Maybe we, maybe you can send me the link and I'll pop that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I don't think anyone's got any more questions. So I think we've covered everything. So thank you everybody that has watched this morning. Um, I'm going to put the replay on my um, profile on LinkedIn and also be in the Facebook group as well. Um, but thank you ever so much, Caroline, for your time. I'll put up all your links on and people and um, your email address to get the cover letter template as well. So thank you for watching and thank you for joining, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye.